Hello, my name is Michael Circuit Parr, one of the trustees of the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospitals Nurses League, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the annual Betty Lee Lecture for 2020. This year, as with so many other events, it's being held virtually because of the current coronavirus situation. However, as a group of trustees, we were absolutely determined that the event should go ahead, given its importance in our annual calendar. While we will all miss meeting our friends and colleagues in the Education Centre, we still feel sure that you will enjoy the lecture, you will learn something new, and you will reflect on memories evoked by our speaker. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to spend a few moments talking about the lady in whose honour this annual lecture is given, Miss Betty Lee. Betty, born and raised in Norwich, undertook her nurse training at the Mile End Hospital in London, which had an affiliation with the London Hospital. Betty was unable to train in Norwich because at that time, the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital did not accept city residents for nurse training. Qualifying as a state registered nurse in 1946, Betty had developed an interest in orthopaedic nursing, and she worked in this specialty for a year before undertaking her midwifery training. Following her midwifery training, Betty returned to Norwich where she worked again in orthopaedics and became a ward sister in 1953. In 1967, Betty was asked by the then matron to take on her first teaching role. Her remit was to set up the enrolled nurse training for the hospital. Betty was incredibly successful in this role and she remained in nurse education until her retirement in 1985. Betty has a long-standing relationship with the Nurses League and was membership secretary for over 40 years and she remains an honorary vice president. She has also maintained her links with the London Hospital Nurses League and has for many years organised the flowers for the annual Edith Cavell Memorial Service at the Cathedral in Norwich. It is impossible in a few words to express the vast contribution Betty has made to nursing, nurse education and indeed the Nurses League over very many years. But I think we would all agree that to have an annual lecture in her name is a very well deserved honour for a fine nurse and nurse teacher. So now to our speaker. We are incredibly pleased and honoured to have Mr Richard England, consultant paediatric surgeon from the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital Foundation Trust speaking today. Richard spent most of his childhood in West Norfolk and remembers the odd trip to the Jenny Lind. He developed an unshakable interest in medicine and surgery and graduated from Sheffield Medical School in 1999. After spending his electives in a hospital in Cape Town, in a trauma unit and in paediatric surgery at Great Hormond Street Hospital for Children in London. So paediatric surgery was the obvious choice and his surgical training took him up the M1 between Nottingham, Sheffield and Leeds. After passing the FRCS, Richard escaped again to warmer climes and spent 15 months as a visiting registrar at the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital back in Cape Town. There he developed further his interest in paediatric colorectal disorders. He took up his current post as consultant paediatric surgeon here in Norwich in 2013. Richard has continued his interest in colorectal surgery and was the founding secretary of the UK Paediatric Colorectal Group. Recently, with a celebration of Jenny Lind Hospital's 165th birthday and this week's 200th anniversary of Jenny Lind's birth, Richard has found him researching the life of story of Jenny Lind, who helped establish our own children's hospital. This, he admits, has become something of an obsession. From searching for her lost harmonium, visiting her grave in Malvern, spending hours in the archives, and recently becoming a fully paid up proud member of the Swedish Jenny Lind Society. Life, it seems, has taken him around in a complete circle. I would like to conclude by adding that Richard has been a tremendous support and ally of the League's Heritage Committee, which does, under the leadership of Margaret Alcock, sterling work in the collection and collation of a vast amount of historical items and artefacts. 
If we were meeting in the education centre, you would all have been treated to a wonderful display of memorabilia from such an important year for Jenny Lind and the hospital. However, we determined that this will be displayed at some future date, as it is a milestone far too important to be missed. Well, that's enough from me. So now to our speaker, Mr. Richard England. I am deeply honoured to give this year's annual Betty Lee Lecture. Despite the difficult times in which we live, I hope this recorded lecture can reach as many members of the Nurses League as possible, as well as other members of staff within the North Norwich and Jenny Lind Children's Hospitals. This year marks the 200th anniversary of the birth of two very special and influential women. Florence Nightingale and Jenny Lind. And so I want to give you a tale of two Nightingales. Florence was born on the 12th of May 1820 and Jenny was born on the 6th of October 1820. So broadcasting this lecture to coincide with this anniversary is extra special. Florence Nightingale's radical influence on the training and practice of nursing is marked this year by the WHO International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. And so I humbly stand before you as a surgeon, not to give you a lecture on nursing, but to draw a surprising number of connections and comparisons between these two remarkable women. They were contemporaries and were introduced to each other by a mutual friend, Sidney Herbert. He had met Florence and her family in Rome and as an influential politician at the time of the Crimean War, was responsible for Florence's opportunities to enter nursing. He also subsequently arranged for her to lead a team of nurses to the Barrack Hospital in Scutari, Turkey. So let's go back to the beginning for both women. Jenny was born out of wedlock and in poorer circumstances than Florence. Her mother was divorced and had vowed never to marry again. However, she enjoyed the company of Nicholas Lind and well, things happen. Anna Maria, her mother, had to close her school and take the new baby to a wet nurse in the countryside to avoid scandal. There she would grow up for three to four years before eventually being brought back to live in Stockholm as her niece. However, the relationship was always tense. The girl was often scolded, left hungry and treated roughly compared to her older sister. Later on, when Anna Maria's previous husband died and his financial contributions ceased, she was forced to find better paid work some distance away. Jenny was in the way and so her mother placed an advert in the paper for someone else to take her in. This led to one of the first serendipitous events in her life, for the couple that answered the advert were also the caretakers of the widow's home where Jenny's dear grandmother lived, the only person who really cared for her. Florence, in comparison, was born into privileged circumstances. Her parents were well off and lived in a large house, Embley Park in Hampshire. It's now an independent school. They enjoyed the trappings of Victorian upper-class society. However, Despite some leeway in giving her more of an education than most girls, family life and their expectations for Florence was like a prison. Tradition dictated she would learn how to run a household, bear children and become a devoted wife. Nothing more. 
It was around the age of three or four years old that Jenny Lynn's natural musical talent became apparent. One day she was listening to a marching band in the street and went to an old piano in the room and picked out that same tune by ear. Hearing footsteps, she stopped and cowered under the piano for fear of being scolded. However, it was her grandmother who found her and asked with some amazement if it was her playing. Her mother was told of the incident and her grandmother prophesied. Mark my words, some day that girl will bring you help. I've tried to learn that same marching band tune on the piano and believe me, it's not that simple. However, it was a child singing that really made her dreams come true. For when she was living in the widow's home, she was given a small kitten and she liked to sit on the windowsill and sing to her kitten. A passerby in the street heard the most beautiful singing and spotted the little girl. She happened to be a maid to a dance at the Royal Theatre and ran home to tell Mademoiselle Lund, who then visited the girl and, after hearing for herself, asked Anna Maria to allow Jenny to sing for a singing master at the theatre school. Anna Maria refused, but was eventually persuaded by the grandmother who once more was looking out for little Jenny. Jenny did sing for Herr Crulius and the head of the school, Count Puke. Both were moved to tears by the extraordinary singing of a nine-year-old girl and immediately offered her a place there at the school, the youngest ever girl to be admitted. Florence's interest in nursing began with small animals, begin, beginning with a pigeon, then a sheepdog, and perhaps most famously an owl. She named it Athena after she found it injured on a trip to Athens. As a child, she became aware that by carefully looking after injured animals, she had the power to make them well again. She would stay up late reading books on healthcare and as a young adult, she would often be found visiting with sick in a nearby village. A charitable endeavour for any Victorian lady, um, but in Florence's case, perhaps a more practical work. Although Florence is renowned for teaching on nursing skills, it's also her penchant for statistical analysis that brought her to prominence. Through her desire for a proper education and her father's help, she became a skilled mathematician and was adept at cataloguing and analyzing data. Later on, her coxcomb charts of mortality in the army demonstrated the alarming fact that most deaths were attributed to disease and preventable causes, not through combat wounds. Both women resorted to subterfuge to realise their goals and protect themselves, despite the strict rules concerning the freedom of women at that time. Jenny, while training at the theatre school, was back living with her mother. The contract with the school was well constructed, as it was clearly evident from the start that Anna Maria did not have Jenny's best interests at heart. The school asked that other girls should board with Jenny's family and the school would pay for their keep. Jenny was also to receive a tender mother's care. However, Anna Maria skimped on food and the girls were often tired and hungry. The other girls demanded to leave and were boarded at the school. Jenny and her friend Louise Johansson stayed behind, but soon enough was enough. They arranged for their belongings to be hidden in laundry baskets. Louise had prepared lodgings with another family, and the next morning stoked up an argument with Anna Maria, saying she would be leaving. As Jenny entered the argument, Anna Maria 
predictably lashed out, telling her she might as well leave as well. And so they did, collecting their belongings from the laundry and heading to the safety of friends with the essential verbal permission from her mother. Florence was set on becoming a nurse, but to her parents, this was not a respectable occupation for a lady. They refused time and time again. However, after meeting Sidney Herbert in Rome and confiding in him about her dreams, he made her aware of other unmarried women like her who had attended a hospital in Dusseldorf, Germany, for the training to be a nurse. The Kaisersworth Training Hospital was run by a Protestant, Theodor Fleidner, who trained young women to care for convicts, the poor and children. In July 1850, without her parents' consent, she travelled to Germany and visited the Kaiserswerth Hospital for two weeks. The accommodation was very basic compared to what she was used to, but she felt this was her God-given calling and felt at home there. When she returned, her parents were furious that she had gone without consent. However, they could see how determined she was, and their arguments softened. After a time, they agreed that she could return to finish her training. With the conditions that her mother and sister would accompany her to Germany, and that no one else should know where they were going. After completing her basic training there, they returned to England, and by that time she was 33 years old, and had earned the right to a life independent of her family. Where to start? Jenny Lind was rarely described as outwardly beautiful. Simply dressed, she shunned makeup, and she herself called her nose short and potato-like. However, her modesty, natural beauty, and the effect she had on people, together with the transformation she underwent when she began to sing, meant that she was not short of admirers. Initially, she was careful and always maintained her high religious morals. She turned down proposals of marriage from Julius Gunther, her co-star in the Stockholm Opera, avoided an affair with Adolf Lindblad, Swedish composer, turned down numerous proposals from a fanatically lovesick Hans Christian Andersen, avoided an affair with Mendelssohn, although there may be some letters between them of a romantic nature, accepted a proposal from Julius Gunther, which lasted a few months, bizarrely accepted a proposal from Claudius Harris, an army officer whose mother felt that her singing career and the theatre in general was the devil's work. At the eleventh hour, with legal counsel and sensible advice from Catherine Stanley, our bishop's wife, this engagement was finally broken. At some point she also turned down a proposal from Arthur Stanley, the son of Bishop Stanley. Again, slightly bizarre, as he was tone deaf. I will give the Hollywood engineered suggestions of a romantic affair between Jenny and Barnum, the circus impresario, the little attention it deserves. Finally, she accepted the proposal of Otto Goldschmidt, a German pianist and composer who had followed her for many years, eventually marrying her at the end of her American tour in 1852. Florence was also popular and outwardly attractive. She had several marriage proposals, but knowing that marriage would end her ambition of a nursing career, 
she refused them all. Her cousin Henry Nicholson, Marmaduke Riley, Henry Verney, who later married her sister Parfie, Richard Milnes, the poet and philanthropist, came the closest. He did share some of her interests, but still his views of how a wife should behave were completely incompatible with her own. I hope I am starting to paint a picture of how determined these two women were in their younger days. Hard work was not alien to either of them. Both studied hard in their own fields and were by no means spoon-fed opportunities. Jenny, following her training at the theatre school, was notching up to a hundred performances a year. It was no wonder that her voice became tired and in 1841 she had to travel to Paris to relearn how to sing under the tuition of Manuel Garcia. However, this is not all. I can only imagine the uncomfortable journeys that she undertook between countries and on tours of Sweden and England in the middle of winter. Her own arrival in Norwich in 1847 was described by Catherine Stanley. I went to her room and found a poor creature in the last stage of exhaustion, wiping dew from her brow and looking ready to sink into the earth. With fatigue, and no wonder, she had sung in Edinburgh on Monday until three o'clock, got to railway at four, and travelled all night. She apologised profusely that she was in no state to join the company that evening, and their reaction was blank horror when she said in French, I hope I can sing tomorrow, but I doubt it. For Florence, her work ethic is undisputed. The lifestyle at Kaiserswerth Hospital in Dusseldorf was basic and following that, she was almost immediately in charge of her own institution in London. I won't dwell on the horrors which she faced during her time in Scutari during the Crimean War, which are well recorded, and despite her ill health, her prolific letter writing in her latter years formed the backbone of radical changes in nursing care from then on. Jenny Lind may have been an artist, but for a moment may I touch on her own nursing experience. Her sister Amalia died of cholera when Jenny was 15 and lat later in November 1849, while returning to Sweden, they stopped in the port of Lübeck, Germany, as her companion Josephine Amundsen had fallen ill with a fever. Jenny refused to leave her side, even though she had been summoned as court singer to perform for her king's birthday. Jenny developed a characteristic friendship with the city of Lübeck, putting on concerts and attending dances. It is the place where she signed her contract for the American tour. And so it is with some irony that the carpet for women of the city gave her as a gift is now in our hands. And I now use the story to describe Jenny's own nursing opportunity to our own Nurses League members who have had the privilege of viewing the Lubeck carpet itself at our city museum. While we brace ourselves for the second wave of our own pandemic, it's worth discussing the effects the epidemics of the 19th century had on these women. Florence's own nursing skills were first put to the test during the 1837 flu epidemic when she was 16 years old. Apart from her and the cook, everyone in the house was struck down. Constant rounds of tea and cold compresses helped her patients through, and she was relieved that no one under her care succumbed. 
This experience led to her call from God to be of service to others a month or so later. Jenny narrowly escaped being caught in the cholera epidemic that hit Paris in 1849, but it did take the life of another opera star, Catalani. The two were friends and it was a sad time for Jenny. Perhaps at this period of history, the press was starting to flex their muscles and were enjoying how they could whip up circulation figures by clever imagery or nicknames. Jenny and Florence were perhaps the first celebrities of their time, and so with no exception. After a concert in Uppsala, Sweden, in 1840, the local newspaper wrote, But in addition to nature's beautiful singing birds, there came thither on Whitson Eve a nobler nightingale, the famous Jenny Lind. The nickname, the Swedish Nightingale, stuck. Florence was first called the Lady with the Lamp by a war reporter from the Times who had seen her doing her rounds late at night at the Barrack Hospital. His article, published in February 1855, led to similar articles and drawings of her carrying a candle or oil lamp, despite the actual lamp looking a little like this picture, a Turkish lamp called a Feynus. Jenny had been labelled with celebrity status since her first performance as prima donna in Stockholm at the age of 17. However, fame was never comfortable and she was naturally shy with acute attacks of anxiety at every new audience. However, as she conquered Europe and hope built that she might one day appear in England, the hype rose to a crescendo. At her debut in London on the 4th of May 1847, Jenny Mania literally became a Jenny Lind crush. Her eventual biographer was there and remarks in a footnote how he was knocked over in the foyer of the theatre and only rescued from being trampled by a friendly giant who hoisted him back to his feet. And just to add an extra dimension to his talk, Florence Nightingale was there. She was swept along with the celebrations of, the, of Jenny's performance and wrote in her diary that, to describe her, one actually needs a quite new language. Florence's growing celebrity status occurred while she was still abroad, and although her mother enjoyed the heightened status, Florence and her father were not so keen. Florence described retention as tinsel. However, celebrities like Jenny Lind can become adept at using their popularity to further the causes they are interested in. And so, with the establishment of the Nightingale Fund in 1855 by Sidney Herbert, Jenny Lind needed no persuasion to hold a charity concert in Exeter Hall on March 11th, 1856. Jenny Lind and Otto paid all the costs. Mrs. Benedict and the Blash and Mr. John Mitchell, the printer, waived their fees, allowing the concert to raise the £1,872 for the training of nurses. When they met, Florence gave Jenny a locket with her portrait in, an affectionate inscription thanking her for her help. A bust of Queen Victoria, by now a mutual friend of them both, was also given to them as a thank you for what was a not insignificant boost to the fledgling fund. The Nightingale Fund continues today to support nurses' training. Likewise, Jenny Lynn set up a scholarship 
to help young musicians. This year, that same scholarship was awarded by the Royal Swedish Musical Academy to the soprano Tessin Maria Le Musari, evidence of its longevity. In addition, the Mendelssohn Scholarship Foundation was also initiated with Jenny's assistance and again continues to this day. Of course, I would not be sitting here speaking to you now if it was not for the generosity of the Swedish Nightingale, who in two concerts raised the equivalent in today's money of £156,000 for the poor of Norwich. After five years of differing, the City Council agreed to build a children's hospital, the second such institution in the country after Great Ormond Street had opened two years previously. Named after her originally as the Jenny Lind Infirmary for Sick Children, it has, in four different permutations, lasted over 166 years and treated over 4 million children. Florence Nightingale has also had hospitals named after her. The most recent ones opened this year on the 3rd of April by Matt Hancock in London. It treated 54 patients before being mothballed on the 4th of May. Similar hospitals opened around the country and some have now been put back on standby. As Jenny retired from singing, both Otto and herself became prominent tutors and professors of music and singing at institutions in London. Otto at the Royal Academy of Music and Jenny at the Royal College of Music. It is said that Jenny Goldschmidt Lind was quite ferocious as a teacher and had extremely high expectations of her pupils. Was not Florence quite demanding as well? When someone experiences or achieves so much in the early part of their career, then I suspect it's a natural tendency to impart that knowledge as thoroughly as possible later on in your career. Betty Lee, who we honour today, also become a t became a teacher, officially, I believe, for 18 years, However, it's more like 32 years, given the length of time she held the position of sister. Teaching becomes an extremely rewarding role for anyone who has crept up the ladder of seniority in healthcare. I would like to also pay respects to Sarah Jenny Dunsmuir, who died a year ago. She was a great-great-granddaughter of Jenny Lind, and her book, published in 2015, called Jenny Lind, The Story of the Swedish Nightingale, has been a great source of information for this and other lectures. It is littered with mentions of Jenny's association with Norwich, and so provides a lovely tribute to the Swedish soprano who helped establish our own Jenny Lind Children's Hospital. In the 90th anniversary year of the Nurses League, I should also pay special thanks to Margaret Alcock and Mary Dolding and other members of the Nurses League who have been so welcoming to me and my developing obsession with the story of Jenny Lind and her association with Norwich. Their diligent archiving of a history of our children's hospital over the last few years has provided a treasure trove of information, not only fond memories but also lessons. Hospital annual reports and Nurses League journals both demonstrate the importance of good hospital nutrition, fresh air, play, charity, scientific progress and a sense of collegiate pride. Florence Nightingale and Jenny Lind both stood out as women with a determination to pursue their aspirations despite the barriers placed in front of them. 
they remain inspirational figures for us all in these difficult times. Thank you.